Hello and welcome. My name, I do need to disclose that funding for this research was from the National Association of School Nurses through their endowment grant. So what is the role of the school nurse? So here you see the framework for 21st century school nursing practice that was developed through the National Association of School Nurses and in collaboration with the CDC. So if you were to ask a school teacher or an administrator what they believe is the role of the school nurse, they would probably tell you that it's boo-boos and band-aids. Uh, not only that, but I would be willing to bet that many of you probably believe the same thing. But the role of the school nurse is much more and could be much more if challenges and barriers were removed. School nurses are our public health surveillance system. They provide care coordination, develop goals and quality improvement initiatives, and are the health care leaders in the schools. Most school nurses will tell you that this is their role, but they will also tell you that their ability to carry out many of these functions are limited and are often left undone due to issues such as huge workloads and disempowering work environments. So why should we care about school nursing? Each of these items listed here are reasons that school nurses are the glue that are holding our school children's health together. Remember, without health, no learning can take place. School nurses are frequently focused on mitigating some of the social determinant factors of health, such as food insecurity, impact of poverty, and mental health concerns. Their work with students and family ultimately translates to better academic outcomes for students. Studies have demonstrated also that for every dollar invested in school nursing, society would gain $2.20. Therefore, it's imperative that school nurses have the tools they need to support their practice. So what do we know and what do we need to know about the school nurse workload and school nurse work environment? But we have little research. Nothing has been published in the last five years. And the dated research that we do have on the school nurse work environment suggests that school nurses have consistently acknowledged that they feel a sense of powerlessness and they're identifying conditions such as lack of administrative support, lack of participation in decision-making processes and large student to nurse workload ratios. There is literature from school nursing that does support the impact of workload and staffing on student outcomes and academic outcomes. We know the consequences of the school nurses workload can contribute to poor student outcomes, both health and academic. Job satisfaction increases burnout, increases intent to leave, decreases engagement in role and work responsibilities, and also costs the organization in terms of errors, turnover, and hiring costs related to replacing the individual when they do leave. The aims of this research were to build upon a previous Delphi study in which we asked a group of expert school nurses to tell us what activities did they believe needed to be included in a workload instrument? And we came up with over 75 items. We now had narrowed down those list of 75 items to about 40. And we are looking to seek confirmation from the, uh, those items that they did indeed cover the range of workload that the school nurses do experience. We also wanted to identify from that list workload indicators that we could, we could actually measure and then develop from that a list that could be used in a workload tool and um, adequately represent what happens in the school nurse. We used focus groups to help us gain an understanding about those workload indicators. We had focus groups that ran across the country. 27 school nurses helped us understand more about those workload indicators. And as you can see from the pie charts, we were able to find school nurses from across the country. So we had representation from East Coast to West Coast and North to South in the US. And also we wanted to make sure that we 
ask school nurses from a variety of different years of work experience and also based on the number of students that they serve, what was their workload like? These were the questions that we asked to the focus group participants to help us understand more about the workload indicators that had been previously developed. And we also asked them some general questions about their workload to be sure that we were adequately representing with those indicators everything that the school nurses felt should be included in a workload instrument. These are the findings from our research. We found that there were four areas that we needed to remove due to problems with being able to measure those items empirically. We also discovered that there were problems with definitions of terms and that school nurses also indicated that they had difficulty with locating certain data points, that there was problems with access to information. For example, free and reduced lunch was a problem in some areas of the country and also quality data collection. We also discovered when we laid out what was in a workload instrument from our previous Delphi study, that the components of leadership and quality improvement were not included at all in that workload instrument. And if we want a workload instrument that demonstrates to others who are using this tool to understand staffing or what we do as school nurses, if leadership and quality improvement are not part of that instrument, then that would lead others to believe that they must not be important enough to be measured and therefore, why would we even consider that a school nurse should be involved in leadership or doing any kind of quality improvement in their practice? Study implications are listed here. Many of the biggest findings that we came here related to suggesting that the scope of the role of the school nurse practice is really not being adequately articulated to our stakeholders and to school administrators. We also noticed that, especially now in the pandemic with emergency and disaster response, that when there's large workloads, the school nurses don't have the time to focus and prepare when indeed there could be a need for an emergency or disaster respo response. These are the practice implications that we discovered from the findings in our research. First of all, we really began to discuss, is this a healthy work environment? School nurses are telling us more than just the fact that they have large workloads or caseloads, that there are a lot of components to their work environment and they're not being adequately considered. So for example, the career ladder, many school nurses talked about the inability to move forward in their career that teachers and educators who are often in the same union, union as they are, have an ability to move up the career ladder and school nurses do not. There was a lot of discussion also about being able to self-advocate, be a leader and also empowerment. There were discussions about policies that require collection of school nurse workforce data statistics. There are none. And indeed you can go on the New Jersey State Department of Education website, and you can find out how many teachers there are per students in every single school in the state of New Jersey. You can't find out at all how many school nurses are there in each district or by school, which is interesting. Conceptual framework model to link outcomes is needed, and we do know that we need to create more partnerships. These were things that needed to be considered in terms of future research. We need pilot testing of this instrument. We need better and more quality type of data collection. Inclusion of indicators for leadership and quality improvement need to be in there. We need to have an initial place to start benchmarking trends. Um, and lastly, policy making and consideration of why can't we have magnet schools like we do for magnet hospitals? So thank you for your time and attention. If you have further questions or want more information, my contact information is here on this slide. Thank you so much for uh, Beth's uh, information uh, uh, sharing. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Joseph Henderson. 
Thank you. Let me just get my slides up. All right, so I want to tell you about some work that the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies has been doing in Yemen um, and some work that I have written along with Professor David Wood, one of our professors of practice. So we've already published this in a journal and we were fortunate enough to be able to publish a couple of pieces last month in the Washington Post and in a um, political science blog on conflict research. So if you're at all interested in reading the full forms, um, you can you can Google these titles and you'll find them. So I just want to talk a bit about what's happening in Yemen uh, economically. Um, we're, we're, our study is on sort of economic effects of conflict and we're very much focusing on what's happening at the household level, right? Specifically, I want to talk about how people are coping and this thing we call functional markets that have risen in the conflict context, right? Where uh, in this chaotic context, these ad hoc local markets have sort of risen to fill people's needs um, with all the disruption that comes from conflict. So our data comes from a survey of 800 households. Uh, it's, it's a stratified sample. The first, the first layer of stratification is not randomized. We, we did it by region and by levels of violence and development. But then in the actual survey sites, we randomized by going to every nth house and interviewing the um, head of household there. We also did eight focus groups, including 72 people, um, to validate our survey findings, um, including with youth, with people in business, with people in higher ed, uh, I'm sorry, with people with higher education or lower education levels and across regions. And then finally, we did 15 key informant interviews. We're actually running a second round of this survey right now as well um, of 2,400 households. Uh, and so that way we'll be able to track some of these things over time within Yemen. So let me just talk a little bit about why this conflict is uh, an interesting environment to study this. Um, it's a really complex conflict. Uh, there are many more sides than just two, which is the way most people think about civil wars. Um, you do have a sort of primary two sides, the recognized government, which is abbreviated as the IRG, and the de facto authorities, most people know them as the Houthi rebels, right? Um, and so that'll be abbreviated DFA throughout this. And then in the recognized government areas, there's a lot of local contestation. You have a separatist movement called the Southern Transitional Council. You have Al Qaeda in the Arab, the Arab Peninsula uh, operating in part, and you have dozens of local militias that have varying levels of local authority, right? So as a result, for for people on the ground. What is the law? What are the consequences for breaking the law? And who is the authority who enforces the law? These are hard questions to answer for, for people, right? It's not clear to people exactly who's in charge in certain places. Um, just to sort of know uh, the, how violent, how much violence is playing a role there right now, um, we've had, a, you've seen 100,000 people killed by the conflict since 2015. 4 million are displaced out of a population of 29 million, and 24 million Yemenis are dependent on food aid right now out of 29 million. So it's a really dire economic situation. And part of what we're, what we argue throughout our pieces is that it, this conflict has reached deep, deep into the middle class. And, you know, we, it's of course worth talking about poverty and impending famine in parts of the country. But even um, it, the situation just for middle class households is just as bad. Um, infrastructure across the country has been completely destroyed as well. So let's just look at some charts and I'll show you, show you how bad things are there. Um, so Questions about services are, uh, so this is the percentage of respondents who responded that are poor or very poor across both the main sex, uh, sections of our sample. 
Um, it's a majority that says roads, road infrastructure is in horrible shape. Um, a majority on both sides says hospitals and health facilities are in really bad shape. And then across the rest of these in the IRG areas, um, there's varying levels of, of service quality, but in the Houthi held areas, it's kind of unanimously bad. Hold on, I have to throw a cat out of the room right now. It's always when I start presenting, but the cat shows up. Very sorry. All right. Um, so life has been completely interrupted um, in a lot of ways as well. So across our sample, when we asked um, how often activities are prevented or interrupted, um, a majority on both sides says school, work, and shopping are interrupted at least once a month um, or a few times a month, right? So just regular economic activities are, uh, you know, they're disrupted constantly. So uh, access to food is probably the biggest crisis besides violence that, the, that uh, Yemenis face right now, right? So this chart shows that um, uh, most households across both sides are spending three to five times as much on food as any other expense. Um, these current, this is listed in Yemeni rials, right? So for example, in the Houthi held areas, they're spending five times as much on food as they are on housing, education, and everything else, right? So just getting food in your bellies is really complicated there. Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, so let's talk about how people cope. So in our sample, 62% of households have sold possessions for food and water, right? Specifically, they're selling their jewelry, they're spending down savings, and they are selling family heirlooms. Um, our interviews and focus groups showed us that Selling heirlooms in Yemen is a sign that people are out of options, right? That's kind of the last thing people do. So to see that 14 and 17 percent of households are reporting doing this means that, yeah, they're they're really running out of options to, to deal with the economic consequences of, of this conflict. Another question we asked to, to understand this was um, basically asking this hypothetical question of, you know, if a 25 year old man wants to earn money and have an income, what is the main way they can do that, right? So across both parts of our sample, they said, you know, joining the fighting, either the, mili the militias, the militaries, or the rebels is the, is the main opportunity to, um, to sort of have an income if you're a young man. Um, also, high levels were local trading and leaving the country, if that's an option for people. So the coping, it, it, families are, ha households are having a very difficult time coping. It's, it's a very dire situation. But we have, we have also seen these markets rise up in this situation um, where in this in this context where rules and violations are hard to determine and where regulatory frameworks are unclear, you've had these markets rise that we call functional markets, right? So to kind of measure these, we asked about um, how pe people are using black markets and for all kinds of goods, water, electricity, medicine, um, currency, uh, people are relying on unregulated spaces for the most part. Although when you get down into the details, in fact, there is a lot of uh, extortion in these markets and the, the, some of these local authorities or these parallel authorities are intervening in marketplaces as a way to sort of extract rents and support conflict. So yeah, one minute left, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, specifically, the Houthis in the North have <laughs> really, they, they were really reported to have a much heavier hand in these markets, right? So they were much more likely to be reported to impose fines and take over businesses. And we were told in our interviews that 
Um, you know, if if your household doesn't contribute to the fighting in some way, you will face consequences, right? Specifically, one common example is that you pay a lot more for cooking gas if they if they know that you don't have any sons who are fighting in the conflict, right? So there's sort of pressure placed at the household level to get involved in this conflict. And as a result, um, our respondents had very differing opinions on what needs to happen first to start to move towards peace, right? So we asked this question, should we stop war income first or should we reach peaceful solutions first? And the Houthi held areas, they said, we have to stop people earning income from war before we can have a chance at peace. And in the uh, nationally recognized part of the country, they said, if we get a peace deal, economic growth, economic opportunity will follow, right? So this is the sort of starkest divide between both parts of the country as they're controlled right now. So key takeaways are that um, these markets have, coping is very difficult. These markets have provided a way for households to get essential goods and services, but they have also provided opportunities for extortion and um, funding conflict, which uh, we'd say is still a problem. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over my time a bit here. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Margarita from Mesit. I hope say your name correctly. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm on sabbatical this year, so I haven't used Teams uh, very much. I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint. And uh, you are presenter. You you should just click the the sharing button. Okay. Is this? Are you seeing this? C can you see my my PowerPoint? Not yet. No, not yet. Um, Go to. You you're using that uh, the arrow pointing up that's right next to the leave button. On, on the top right hand corner. Yes, but it's, it's, it's pointing down. Pointing up, uh, pointing it should down. Either be pointing way. up because you're not presenting yet. OK, so it's pointing up, but now it's now I, I clicked on it and, and I'm going to go. And click on what you want yeah. to display. Yeah, if it's pointing okay. down, that yeah, means yeah. the share tray is open. OK, is it there is it go. visible now? No, not yet. You'll have to select which option. Uh, like if you if you already have the PowerPoint open, you'll be able to select which presentation you'd like and then you'll launch it. Or then it will launch to us. OK, so I'm, I'm I have opened my PowerPoint, um, but I opened the actual document that I wanted. So okay. there's something that says share. Is that what? Yeah, yep. share. Uh, no, because that is about sending it to OneDrive. So no, this no, is no. very embarrassing. Um, no, within uh, Microsoft Teams, there'll be a uh, next to the leave button or your microphone controls. There'll be an arrow that'll allow you to open the share tray. OK, so there is an arrow yep. and, and uh, I'm already using most of my minutes and there is. Click on the click on the arrow and then you'll see at the bottom of the screen it'll show up. Uh, it'll show so, something you can select. It should be the PowerPoint. You pick the PowerPoint. Which is what I'm doing now. OK, so let me let me close it. I can I can do it without the PowerPoint also if, if that uh, if you I cannot show it, but let me I pointed on the arrow. And I have different screens. Yeah, pick the screen you want to display. OK, I. I killed it, so I have to look for it again. Go to the arrow again and then click the screen you want to show the, the, the. So I have to open it, OK. Yes. So I have opened the PowerPoint, but it's not open on your. So if I already opened, can I just go to it? Oh. Yes, now, now you should be able to share it with us through the, the share tray in Teams. But do I keep it open? You can, yes. You'll uh, need to have it open, Margarita, for it to appear in your share tray. OK, it's open that now. That's correct. So now go into the Teams application. You can click on the, the Teams link down in the taskbar. That'll open all of us. Uh, and then you'll see the share button. Uh, that should yes, be on your taskbar. Now when you click on that, 
it should open the share tray and the PowerPoint that you've just opened should now be available in the share tray. It is, it is, and I'm I'm there. And now when you can you click on that PowerPoint yes. in the share tray? We got yeah. it. Hey. There, there you go. go. Oh my god. All okay, right. so I have two five minutes left. Um okay. So I'm gonna um put it in presentation start from the beginning and go to the slideshow. Yes, Hello? slideshow. Oh, you can move on this way, it's okay. It, it appears Marguerite is frozen. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Her, her bandwidth. Is Margarita, to conserve bandwidth, you may want to turn off your camera feed. That'll lessen some of the load on your, your, uh, your signal. So where, where are we now? Uh, you are just going you to talk. <laughs> we can see it. OK, so I'm going to do it in four minutes. Um, I'm sharing with you a new project I'm starting and I'm thinking about during my sabbatical. I have no idea what will, what will come out of it, but I wanted to share with you some of the ways in which it relates to my former or my previous work and some of the hunches that are um, behind it. So basically, I'm, I've am i been working on Eastern Europe for about 20 years on energy, and I'm the kind of researcher that deals less with databases and more with on the ground research. I have done many years of research on the ground in that area and speak several languages of the region. Um, and basically all the work I have done until now, or, or most of it has been related to energy politics and the motivation for it has been being dissatisfied with very, in my view, superficial views of Russia's use of energy as a weapon vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. And what I have tried to do, what I try to do with my work in the last 20 years is to rather take a look at energy from below, from the role of the actors in the countries involved, looking at the black box that you see here in my slide. And as a result of that, I, I wrote several books on this, one on energy corruption, one comparing the energy politics of three post-Soviet states and how they, those policies in turn affected their politics. Um, another book on how manipulating energy politics allowed a very, apparently very weak country such as Belarus to manipulate its relations with its much more powerful patron Russia. And in my fourth book, which is coming out next week, I'm actually taking a totally different approach and I'm looking at how technology, uh, the specific technology of different types of energy affects the way actors may uh, use energy for political goals, both domestic actors and external actors. And I could tell you a lot about that book, but I'm not here to talk about that book. I'm here to talk about my new project. And basically, uh, the way my new project relates to that previous work is that I have learned that when you talk about energy, it's not simply about, about vertical links or about supply from A to B, but that they are very important horizontal links. For example, in the case of oil with chemical industries, with fertilizers, with metallurgy, and has made me realize how important it is to look at technology, but, but to look seriously at technology. Um, so in my new book project, or what perhaps may be my new book project, I'm looking at the question of how do high and low technology interact to support certain types of political development, especially in situations of flux, such as in the former Soviet Union. And we know that even when we are used to pay much attention to high technology, low technology matters. And in the case of the book I may be writing, I am looking at three steel making technologies in particular. I'm trying to understand why one particular type of energy te uh, steel technology, the open heart furnace, which basically has disappeared from, <laughs> uh, from the world except in one country. Why does it continue to work in that country, in particular Ukraine, and actually propel the country to the role of a top five steel exporter in the 2000s and actually propped a particular political regime. So um, 
in this possible book, I'm going to be following these three technologies. I'm going to see how interest groups coalesce among them to make possible the survival of a totally obsolete technology anywhere else in the world. How could it survive? How could it bring that country, Ukraine, to a top role as an exporter and actually prop a political regime? Um, how is this related to, to the future? Well, uh, we know that uh, there is no future for a planet without decarbonization and the building transition is the next frontier. Steel is the next frontier. The big question is how can we support clean decarbonized steel technologies? But to understand this, we also need to understand what keeps outdated te technologies being used and what prevents new technologies from being used. And finally, how it relates to me and what I have done in the past. Well, if I do this project, um, I, I, um, based journals and materials only in uh, Ukrainian and, and Russian. And uh, I think um, with my technical expertise in the area and my language knowledge, I should be able to uh, do this. I'm sorry for the technical glitch. I'm happy to discuss further and thank you for your patience. Yes, certainly uh, we shall have you uh, come back um, after all this. OK, so our next speaker is Dr. Xie. Um, Dr. Xie? OK, uh, uh, could you please exit uh, Dr. Mel Marcelet? Could you please uh, let me share? OK, so. Uh, Burke, I think you can, yeah. OK, can you see my screen now? Yes, please put on okay. the slideshow. Thank you. So thank, uh, you. Move on. thank you. First of all, I thank you for the uh, University Research Council for, for providing the uh, summer funding. I also thank the uh, Dr. Suri Chan, Dr. Uh, Cosimo Anton, and Dr. Jose Lopez to make this uh, university research uh, symposium happen. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, research of my project. It's a COVID-19 pandemic and the bond ETF valuation premiums. And it's a joint work with Frank Tan, with Elinor Shi, and both are in the finance department in Stephen School of Business. So here is the uh, uh, outline of this research. So what is a uh, uh, exchange traded fund? So exchange traded fund is very much like an index mutual fund. However, it is traded on exchange as a stock. So it's a very convenient and it attract a lot of investors. And also the stocks uh, can reflect information uh, more rapidly than the uh, mutual fund. So uh, the first uh, US listed uh, equity uh, ETF was on the January 1993. Uh, and then the first bond ETF was introduced on uh, July 2002. But within the last couple of uh, uh, two three or uh, decades, the uh, ETF industry address uh, uh, grown uh, very rapidly. So by the end of uh, 2019, uh, they all together have uh, uh, more than four trillion dollars as under management, and the bond ETF managed 1.2 trillion dollars. So what is the concern? for this uh, bond ETF. Well, uh, here actually this is my original proposal to evaluating the systemic risk of bond ETF uh, because the, uh, uh, since the uh, global financial crisis in 2007 and 2009, the corporate bond uh, markets actually developed rapidly and uh, reached the highest level of uh, as a percentage of GP GDP and also the triple B rated bonds, which is the lowest uh, investment grade bonds and uh, also grow to roughly to represent 50% of investment bonds. Okay, and for example, if we look at one of those uh, corporate bond ETF, uh, it's called the uh, iShare USD investment grade corporate bond ETF. So this is one of the oldest uh, fixed income bond. So you check this uh, iBox uh, investment grade index. So you can see from here that's the uh, uh, the weight of components on different weightings. So you can see for this uh, 
triple B bonds and the triple B plus, triple B minus, if you add all them together, so roughly 47% of the of all those bonds in the index actually belong to the triple B. So if the uh, if something uh, bad happen on the market, so if we trigger a large scale of uh, downgrading, and then it's going to cause huge trouble on the market. So that's the uh, original concern for the systemic risk. And it turns out to be true when we have this uh, uh, COVID-19 financial crisis. So at the very beginning of the 2020, the stock market actually was uh, keeping on the uh, the bull momentum uh, and which is highest level on the February uh, 19. That is uh, the highest uh, only seven points to 4000 for the S&P 500. But but then it start to decline. OK, and then within a couple of weeks, uh, it lost more than 30 percent of value. OK, and then the uh, stock market uh, was declared into a uh, bear market. So what did the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, do try to help this market. So uh, uh, just like what happened for the last financial crisis and the uh, Federal Reserve actually react to this uh, uh, unexpected uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, rapidly with a lot of measures. First of all, they use some traditional method that is they cut the uh, federal funds rate uh, to almost zero and then it started the uh, uh, quantitative easing. They start to purchase treasury uh, securities and mortgage rate securities and lower the reserve requirement to almost zero. And also like what happened in last financial crisis, it uh, quickly uh, initiate this uh, commercial paper funding facility, primary uh, dealer credit facility and money market mutual fund facility. Also extend this facility to cover the municipal uh, there. But it looks like the market uh, was not that much appreciated of the, all those uh, measures of the Fed. Okay, and then on uh, February, on March 30, on March uh, 33, and then the Fed starts with uh, extensive new measures to try to uh, support the economy, and that include the primary market corporate uh, credit facility and the secondary markets credit facility and to provide the liquidity for the corporate bond markets and bond ETF. And this actually is the first time the Fed uh, uh, wants to uh, directly to uh, purchase a, a bond ETF. And also uh, later on we expand this uh, uh, program to cover the what's called the fallen angels, which was originally investment grade bond, but was just uh, downgraded before March 2022. 20, uh, so, our uh, our research question is uh, uh, what exactly happened to the bond ETF uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis and how is the uh, impact of this Fed's uh, new facility and what about the other government measures to uh, uh, help this bond ETF. So uh, to understand the uh, ETF market, we want to look at something called the uh, market valuation premium. So basically it's every day at the end of the day, we were going to see the uh, price uh, actually, during the day, we can also see it. The, the price of ETF and compare with the net asset value divided by net, net asset value, and that's called a premium. So if this number is negative, it's uh, called a discount. So when this uh, valuation uh, uh, premium is a discount, the typically is going to uh, indicate something's wrong in the uh, bond market. So um, basically, uh, th this measure can help to provide uh, uh, price discovery and tell us what's going on uh, in the ETF and on the uh, underlying bond market. So what do we find? So basically we find that uh, the co uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, death count actually is uh, highly so, uh, related to the variation discount. So when we see more uh, death counts, we're going to see more severe variation discount. However, this discount, this discount reversed dramatically after the Fed's uh, a commitment to purchase bonds and bond ETF, and also uh, some of the government's measure also help to uh, improve this uh, bond uh, ETF market. So uh, when let's give this a little literature review. Basically, we have a, a booming literature on this uh, area now. So here we have the data, and then one thing about this is that uh, usually the premium is positive. However, during this COVID-19 uh, period, it becomes negative, and that becomes a big issue. So uh, what do we find? Basically, uh, here is uh, we find the link of the change of the uh, discount is, is related to the negative related to the 
uh, market price premium. Basically, it causes a discount. And then, however, uh, uh, some of the uh, Fed function actually uh, improve this uh, uh, premium and uh, quickly reverse that uh, discount. And that basically is our funding. And let's conclude. Uh, basically, is, uh, we found that uh, uh, there was a huge discount uh, during this COVID-19 period, and it's highly related to this death count. But the Fed's action uh, helped to uh, uh, relieve this uh, stress in the in the market, and also some of the government measures also helped this market. And that basically uh, is the is our paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shen. It's Thank very you. amazing to uh, run through 28 slides. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate and it. our next speaker is uh, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, um, and thanks for giving me the chance to speak today. Um, I am going to be, I think, both very radical and also perhaps very old fashioned in not using slides for my 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go with, uh, I know it's uh, it's both, you know, new and old here um, to, uh, to speak a little bit about my project. Um, so on June 4th last year, um, shortly after George Floyd was murdered, California Congresswoman Barbara Lee introduced a House resolution calling for the establishment of a U.S. Commission on Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. She reintroduced it a few months ago with Senator Cory Booker's support. It's coming along with um, a well-publicized, um, renewed push to put H.R. 40 to the House floor, which is a resolution that would study the possibility, would create a commission to study the possibility of reparations for African Americans that has been reintroduced in the um, in Congress for about 30 years now. In August, the Iowa City Council approved a resolution for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in its city. The Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been ongoing recently, studying, um, holding public meetings and regional hearings on the history of racially motivated lynchings by mobs in Maryland. Um, and there have been many similar city and state level proposals um, in places including New York, Boston, Austin, Detroit, Asheville, and many other places. Um, they're certainly prompted by recent events, as is clear by the timing, by uprisings through Black Lives Matter, through recent events and investigations. But of course, they're also part of long-term discussions about memorialization, about statuary and university involvement in Confederate histories and otherwise, um, and many other localized efforts. Also, these are homegrown initiatives in the sense that they build on, you know, discussions of reparations began after the Civil War in the United States and have gone on since. Um, restorative justice efforts have certainly taken hold in many communities in many different places in relationship to many different modes of violence. But these ideas, these ideas of truth commissions, of reparations, of transformation and racial healing are very much part and parcel of a transnational enterprise called transitional justice which is a piece of the larger human rights movement um, and really has built over the last couple of several decades now since the 1980s around the world. So transitional justice developed largely in the 80s and 90s, first in transitions from authoritarian regimes into democracies, where the question was, how could we deal with the violence and gross human rights violations of the past? And they developed a number of ways, including truth commissions and reparations. There were many amnesties and self-amnesties um, for violators of human rights. The most famous version was in South Africa, where many may have heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place there um, in the transition from apartheid. Over time, this idea of transitional justice, right, a set of mechanisms to deal with the past and specifically human rights violations, also became applied in the conflict to peace scenario. So as situations, as states and societies move out of war into peace, how do you address the crimes and violence that was committed under past regimes, but also during conflict. And most recently, there's been discussion of how this might work in places where there isn't really a transition at all. So Canada ran a very large scale National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it completed its work about five years ago, investigating the very brutal history of the Indian residential school system in Canada. Um, there was a similar effort actually at a smaller scale in Maine in the United States um, called the Maine Wabanaki Truth and Reconciliation Commission that investigated the child welfare services in that state and a very systematic effort over a long period of time 
time to remove Native children from their homes and place them with um, non-Native families, mostly white families. So all of this suggests there's something going on with the idea that maybe transitional justice is more about justice and less about transition, and we need to think about what that means. So it leads us into this idea that people are raising that this might be relevant in the United States now when dealing with questions specifically around anti-Black racism and the histories of violence against African Americans and Black Americans. So my last five minutes. Um, what I want to do is describe my project's relationship to this. Um, first, by suggesting a couple of the reasons that I think this framework has become more attractive recently in the United States, particularly to racial justice advocates. And then to discuss briefly the three questions that I'm attempting to kind of raise in my own research in this project. So first, what is it about transitional justice, right? Why this kind of framework that we saw applied in all these places with dramatic transitions? And I, my suggestion from sort of speaking with people and being involved in some of these projects is that is a couple, is sort of three different versions of why it's attractive in this moment and place. Um, First, it's a way of thinking about justice in a more inclusive and broader way. So there was a lot of discussion after the conviction of Derek Chauvin that this was very important, but also very small in the scope of things. So this discussion of transitional justice raises a lot of discussion about a broader sense of justice, what that might mean, and how it might include elements of recognition of historical injustice, of longer term questions, um, about structural questions and systemic questions around race and violence and human rights. And it expands it outward to think of not just kind of a narrow form of accountability, but also these sort of broader ideas about harms and effects over time, right? So very long ago, just injustices and how that relates to today. Um, however, of course, transitional justice doesn't have all the answers to those. That's sometimes just what seems to be the best parts of it. Um, so what are the questions that I think this raises? So I think there are three main ideas that come up as we start to bring these metrics, these ideas together. The first is a time question. So for what time period are we talking about healing, reparation, or truth, right? So transitional justice tends to think about the most recent bunch of years. That is the way in which the field developed. We have fewer tools for thinking longer term into the past to understand, right, a kind of set of harms that didn't take place in the most recent regime that might have been perpetrated by people who are no longer alive against people who are no longer alive. So we need to think about some broader time issues you, and that's what a lot of my past work recently has been about, um, about how to expand these practices to help us think about these broader time periods. And that will also mean thinking about ideas like how we erase through law, so I'm a lawyer, right? How over time, even in our court decisions, we start to see the erasure of the past gradually over time. So in cases around anti-discrimination, we don't talk much about slavery anymore. We've shifted the framework. In cases with property, we don't talk much about, say, indigenous dispossession, right? So how do we link these together within law is a question that is raised by these projects. The second is the question of responsibility. So how do we think about responsibility in a kind of broad and integrated way that isn't just about victims and perpetrators? Um, and truth commissions help us along that way. I think there are scholars in multiple fields today that are also thinking about this, um, about intergenerational benefit and harm, about legacies of how trauma functions. This is something that has come up a lot in the Canadian context with their TRC, um, the sort of notion of intergenerational transmissions of harm and trauma over time, as well as benefit. Um, and finally, on the kind of reparations question, one issue that we come up with from a lot of different contexts is how do we think about both questions over time of reparation and also questions in the moment about equity, about resources? How do we understand the relationship between past and present in a kind of useful manner? And how can these kinds of commissions and practices and discussions help us on the road of understanding the relationship between 
resources, between material traumas and physical traumas, between sort of all of these different ideas, which is a lot to put on transitional justice, but we can start from do no harm and go to go to the next step from there, which is to say, learn from what has happened in all these other places where we've gone through a lot of these discussions actually, and understand it now within the very specific context of a very broad and very deep set of claims, contestations, and questions that come up in the US context when we talk about racial justice and injustice. Um, so I'll just close out by saying, right, that much of this work is really focused on the idea that the past is critical to how we think about justice, how we think about violence, how we think about present inequities um, and life in a lot of different scope. But it's also not enough because we have to think about the past, not just in terms of what we open or close and not in terms of a singular interpretation, right? Because it can get mobilized in all sorts of different ways, particularly in conflict areas as we've seen. But think about it in relationship to what we're trying to achieve in the present. And for that reason, I think transitional justice has had its challenges in these dimensions, but also opens up a whole new kind of set of range of questions and inquiries that we can really bring to the US context, I think, in a really interesting way. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and I will pass it back to you. Sui. Thank you so much, Dr. Mila. It's quite a refreshing memory about how to listen to the talk. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. David Reed. Great, thank you. Good morning, thank everyone. You. So I'd like to first just thank the organizers of the session. It's really refreshing for me. I think sometimes we get stuck in our own silos of I hear everything related to education. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the College of Education, so it's so nice to hear these different research projects going on. So this is a great event. Um, I too would like to thank the University Research Council for their support um, of my research here. Um, so this study that I'm going to talk about this morning is um, basically how did principals, school principals, um, in traditional K-12 schools here in the US respond um, to some of the challenges over the last 12 months caused by COVID-19. What were their leadership responses and what was um, this has this past academic year in public education been like from their perspective? Um, so pre-COVID-19, um, there's tons of literature supporting the idea that the work of school principals is complex, time consuming and really unpredictable despite attempts to um, strategically plan their day. Principals are often met with unpredictable encounters from students, parents, teachers. Um, it's very difficult to kind of stick to a schedule if you're a school principal. Um, of course, this has been really exacerbated by the pandemic that we've all experienced. Um, everything from principals having, you know, to change from virtual and remote learning to in-person learning to hybrids, you know, sometimes with little or almost no notice. Um, to covering, you know, what happens if teachers or students, you know, are sick or affected by the pandemic. All of these things make leading a school during these times um, very challenging, even more so than in the past. And I think it's important to note that it, I think it's very important to focus on the role of school leaders or school principals specifically because um, quality leadership, perhaps unsurprisingly, is very important to a lot of things that we want to get out of our schools, a lot of de these desirable outcomes that we hope that our schools can help achieve. So um, school principals are second only to teachers as the most influential school based factor that can positively impact these desirable outcomes like increasing student achievement, attendance, on time graduation, college enrollment, those type of things. And even beyond those kind of measures of student success, Principles are super important for lots of other important factors, teacher retention, parent and guardian engagement in schools. Um, so school leaders are kind of a, you know, the center of a lot of these important outcomes. Um, in this line of inquiry that I'm going to speak about here is important for at least three reasons. Um, one, pre-COVID-19, so even before the pandemic, principal turnover and burnout due to stress um, was a concern for many schools and many districts. There's a lot of literature um, talking about how you know the stress in running schools is real and principals are leaving at kind of higher rates than we would like. Um, number two, how principals navigate challenging and uncertain situations like after a you know an incident of school violence or um, you know a natural disaster like a hurricane or tornado. There's a lot of research on that and how principals navigate those situations relates to their effectiveness as a leader. Um, and then related to the first one, how principals navigate challenging and kind of uncertain times has a relationship to their overall health and well-being, which certainly could potentially re relate to stress and potentially 
um, you know, attrition or burnout within the position. So in this study, which I should say is still still ongoing, I'm interviewing principals throughout the school year multiple times. So, you know, we're ending coming to the end of the traditional um, school calendar here. So I'm still interviewing principals and we'll do so at the end of the year again as well. But basically, I wanted to know how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect the daily work of school principals? How did principals respond um, during these last 12 months? And then how did this how did COVID-19 pandemic um, impact the leadership style or behavior? Did anything change in how they were able to lead schools, you know, beyond the obvious of a lot of it was virtual. So I won't get into my methods too much, but I'm a qualitative researcher. So so far I've conducted 31 interviews with 16 principals. Um, there's a little bit of information about them. They were all public school principals. Um, I did the first interview last summer of 2020, kind of when everyone was planning for the school year to get going in the fall. I conducted another interview in um, November, December range and I'll conduct two more interviews with each principal here coming up in the spring and then at the end of the school year. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the pandemic affected the work of principals a lot, of course, um, but what principals did um, to kind of navigate this was they prioritized being accessible and visible as much as possible. Um, that being accessible and visible is a characteristic of principals during normal times, let's call them, um, you know, being out for the buses as they arrive in the morning, being visible at community, sports events, um, those type of things, but principals kind of had to get creative and become what they described as virtually visible, popping into classrooms, you know, up during remote learning, meeting with parents online, much like this, or Teams or Zoom or whatever you were. Um, but principals, the principals in this study repeatedly made the comment that being visible, showing their face was extremely important to all their stakeholders, students, teachers, parents, they needed to show that the principal um, was there. So that, of course, added to their time. A lot of the principals talk about there's no, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this, no distinction kind of between home and work because they're working most of them at home with their computer. So it was difficult to kind of turn it off. Um, and they felt they needed to support their stakeholders. And kind of an offshoot of that is that principals did talk about added stress and anxiety that this um, produced, um, you know, just the kind of the idea of the unknown, not really knowing what was ahead um, for their school students and staff. Um, but importantly, principals, all of the principals in my study really came up with this idea of one, as one principal put it, to put on a brave face. They did not let this stress or anxiety show to teachers, students, or any other stakeholders. Um, as one quote I pulled highlights here, um, even though Principal Mann felt um, very stressed, she didn't want to let it show or manifest itself during her interactions with stakeholders. She felt it was her job really to you know, kind of absorb the stress and anxiety that other people within the school might be feeling. Um, and there's other research that supports that even pre-COVID that principals do that. They feel like that's one of their jobs is to kind of manage the stress, not only their own stress, but their other, the stress of the other stakeholders with whom they interact. Um, as far as the second research question, one theme that really emerged is this idea of distributed leadership. So, you know, principals sharing leadership responsibilities. That's a very common characteristic of school principals. You know, having teacher leaders, other people um, take on some of the large workload that's expected of these individuals. Um, but the principals in this study said that that's very difficult now um, during, excuse me, during the last 12 months because of COVID, um, because they just don't know how to effectively do this. They can't assign tasks to people or have other individuals help them because they don't even know you know, what is expected of them or what will be to do. So that's another contributor. They're having to take on more during um, the pandemic than they have in previous years. They can't rely on kind of these networks, these strategic teams to share these re leadership responsibilities. They're absorbing more, which is in turn, you know, adding to their stress and the level of um, anxiety and kind of um, that they're feeling during this time. So just to sum all this up in my last two minutes, so like like many of us, you know, there's increased work demands on these school principals during the last 12 months. Um, a lot of that is the unknown. They're not able to plan already, as I described, the work of school principals is quite unpredictable and it's even been more so over the last 12 months. Um, so, you know, a lot of principals like Principal Ingalls here express this idea of working many more hours than were previously expected and not really knowing what to do. It's not working kind of with an end goal because the kind of the game changes so often that it's difficult. Um, you know, you might spend three hours planning for some certain schedule, but then things change and you can't use any of it. So it's it's challenging. Um, but further complicating this work is this idea that the principals need to kind of absorb and put on a brave face um, for teachers, staff, students, parents with whom they interact, 
not only manage their own stress, but kind of take on the stress of others to make sure they're putting on, you know, outwardly a brave face for the people in their school and organization that everything's going to be okay. We have this under control. You know, don't worry too much about this. Um, and just to wrap up in the minute, I think that's potentially very um, problematic if principals are going to take this position and do this, um, you know, take on the stress and anxiety related to some of these issues. I think it's imperative they have some outlet um, to express um, these emotions, and that can be set up through school districts. Um, some of the principals talked about having, you know, informal groups of other principals with whom they could speak or, you know, um, even outside of school with family members and stuff. But I think the process could really be formalized if we know that principals are going to take on the brunt of this stress. Um, they need to have some outlet for these emotions. Otherwise, just the burn, burnout turnover is going to be exacerbated and we're going to see more of this, you know, once um, the pandemic is over, this, these trends could really even increase. And as I mentioned, this was exploratory work. So in the future, what I plan to do is I want to look at some of these findings based on, you know, nuance the findings even further. Um, do any of these results or findings of my work vary based on years of experience, school setting, other important factors that might, you know, does a new principal feel differently than a more veteran principal or more veteran principals potentially able to better manage some of these things? OK, that's it. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. It's very um, informative. So our next uh, presentation is a, a recording uh, presentation by Dr. Justin Anderson, Associate Professor and Chair of uh, Moral Theology in Burke. Hello and good morning. My name is Professor Justin Anderson. I'm an Associate Professor in the uh, Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology, and I study and research in moral theology, uh, or if you prefer, Christian ethics. Um, the reason I want to just give a little brief uh, introduction, I'm very grateful to uh, uh, to be a part. I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm uh, the real me is teaching right now, so you have the recorded me, um, but I'll keep it brief. Uh, recordings are never easy to watch, um, and, and just introduce you to a little bit of I think not so much um, why I was awarded this uh, researcher of the year, but more of where I'm going and some future research that I'm looking forward to. Um, and this future research deals with uh, the theology, if you wish, of scandal or the way that um, the Christian church, um, the Catholic intellectual tradition has thought about scandal. Um, and I'll say a few words, I suppose, about that. Um, first and foremost, uh, scandal is something that is present throughout the New Testament. It's also in the Hebrew scriptures, but in the Christian scriptures, it's certainly uh, very present. And it's more present than most people think, because the word um, scandalize in Greek um, or scandalon, um, is not often translated into vernacular languages uh, like English. So uh, many people who uh, have a, at least some knowledge of the Christian scriptures may remember such a phrase as um, the Lord Jesus's words at the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, you know, in uh, exaggeration and hyperbole, he says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Um, in the Greek, the, the, that phrase causes to sin is actually scandalizes. Um, and, and that gives a sort of to a second point. Not only is the language of scandal throughout the New Testament, um, but the early church, uh, the early Christians thought very explicitly about scandal. Um, scholars in the Middle Ages or the scholastics, as we might as we usually call them, thought very seriously about scandal. Scandal was thought about very seriously for hundreds of years in um, in the Catholic tradition, especially informing priests um, about how to handle these sort of things. It works its way into canon law as well as um, morals, as well as pastoral issues. Um, so it's a serious uh, thought and it's very explicit throughout the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition. But I said, I think the second point to take note of here is that the Christian notion of scandal is different than what we normally think of today. When we think of scandal today, we think of something that is emotionally shocking or provocative. Um, for the Christian, the notion of scandal simply comes much more etymologically from its root. 
Um, a scandalon was a uh, was usually a rock or some kind of tripping stone that uh, sat in in the pathway uh, along the way that someone would walk, and so it became an occasion for someone to fall. Now, this was quite literally the physical notion of scandal in in the ancient Greek, and so when it becomes imported into the ancient Greek of the New Testament, amongst other places, it's known as an occasion for someone to fall on their way to God. And so this is slightly different. It could be, it could bring about an emotional shock as we think of scandals today in the world, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to. I oftentimes give my students the example of a parent who uh, scandalizes his or her child um, simply by their bad example. And yet the child is not emotionally shocked, but simply learns to do as the parent did. Um, and so um, this occasion to stumble is, in fact, what causes the child to, to stumble and, 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 in fact, uh, perhaps inculcate a vice uh, or, a, or a wicked human habit, perhaps in how they treat another human being or another group of human beings, etc. So um, the Christian notion of scandal is much more, if you will, objective and less psychological. It's less about that emotional impact, although that could be there. It's much more about objectively, are we helping or are we hindering someone on their walk to uh, or, or with God? And so um, providing an occasion for sin, even if that person doesn't know it themselves. So that notion is helpful in sort of situating it really as a moral issue. But the next thing it brings up is just how serious it is for the Christian. Of course, um, for Christians and for non-Christians uh, who, who know of sort of the Christian teaching, one of the basic teachings is, of course, love, love, uh, a love that is self-sacrificing, much like Christ on the cross, um, can transform us. And, and that's at, at, at very much at the heart of the gospel, uh, the heart of the good news of Jesus Christ. So if that's the vocation, if that's the call of every Christian who wishes to live and pattern their life after Christ, then scandal is quite serious because we're doing the exact opposite than loving our neighbor, than, than helping our neighbor uh, come to know God, come to live and walk with God more, we're actually impeding that in a in, in a sort of a positive way. So um, all of this is to say that my recent research sort of evolves around this. One of the basic texts of the New Testament, though, regarding scandal is Jesus's words in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 6, where he speaks to his apostles about, he says, woe to those for through whom scandal comes. And um, this is always taken up very early for all Christians throughout uh, the centuries uh, since those words of the gospel were written, that uh, one has a serious obligation to avoid scandalizing their neighbor. And that would follow from what we said, what that scandal was. Um, nevertheless, there are points where, um, and we've seen this in, in sort of the recent Catholic uh, churches uh, dealing with particularly clerical sexual abuse scandals that we've seen so prevalently, there can be points where avoiding scandal um, has unfortunately led some people to entertain the idea that we should therefore bury things or silence people who know of things that are derelict or crimes. And so this, um, this tendency, uh, is not part of the Catholic, the authentic Catholic intellectual tradition. And to bear witness to that, um, St. Gregory the Great, who's Pope in the late 500s, al already speaks about an alternative rationale which pushes against this, you must always avoid scandal. He says you must not always avoid scandal. There are some times when you have to let scandal arise. Um, and those cases he uh, cashes out in terms of the notion of truth that truth must be told, that truth must be done, that we must live in the truth, even if scandal were to arise from our living in the truth. And so his words uh, are precisely, and I quote from St. Gregory the Great in 592 to 593, we must consider that it, insofar as we would be without sin, yes, we must avoid scandalizing our neighbor. If, however, scandal is had from the truth, then it is better to let scandal arise than it is to forsake the truth. So it's better to let scandal arise than to depart from living the truth. In the Middle Ages, this, gets, this itself gets dwelt on and elaborated in three notions of truth. The truth of life, 
the truth of teaching or the truth of doctrine and the truth of justice. And in my most recent research, I have used this uh, triplex veritas, this threefold truth get, that gets developed in the Middle Ages to push against this rationale, which sometimes for lack of, uh, for better reason, is just not known, this threefold truth tradition. And it gets lost further on in the Catholic intellectual tradition in the 17, uh, mostly the 18th and 19th century. I haven't found it as prevalent uh, after the Council of Trent as it was before. So some of my work is to bring back this authentic Catholic notion that there are some times when we must allow scandal to arise. And this itself is what Jesus did in the gospel. And I'll end here. Uh, if we read in Matthew 15, uh, his disciples come to him and say that, you know, uh, some of his listeners, some of the Pharisees were scandalized, were offended and scandalized by his words. And, it, and basically, this is where Jesus says, look, let the blind lead the blind. He says, it's enough. We don't have to deal with that. So there are some times when scandal um, can be something that is prophetic. Uh, there could be some times when scandal must arise. And we see this in John chapter six as well. When Jesus is talking about the Eucharist, his disciples find this too hard. They go to leave and he doesn't remit that teaching. Uh, that's that truth of doctrine is still there. So for lack of a better uh, a better conclusion, I'll leave it there. Um, that Jesus himself allowed scandal to arise sometimes under the proper circumstances. We must always avoid scandal. But that's some of the times some, some of the rationale that I'm uh, working with. Um, in the current uh, um, uh, theological context, I think it's a very important mission we have. So thanks for listening and thanks for, um, um, uh, and thanks for all the wonderful contributions. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Denise Vigani. Hi, yes, I'm just gonna get my PowerPoint up. Thank you. Yes, here we are. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, thank so, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, it's long been widely accepted that cultivating virtue of character is a matter of learning by doing. Right? Both Plato and Aristotle draw analogies between acquiring virtue and learning practical skills or crafts. So, for example, Aristotle explains we become builders, for instance, by building, we become harpists by playing the harp. Similarly, then, we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, brave by doing brave actions. Aristotle understands this learning by doing to be a matter of cultivating habits. Virtue of character, he insists, involves developing the right sorts of habits and practicing those habits until they become like second nature. This process of developing virtue is called, fittingly, habituation. As familiar and widely accepted as this picture of character development may be in the moral education literature, many have found it puzzling. After all, a virtuous person possesses practical wisdom and, as Aristotle insists, chooses to perform virtuous actions as a result of reflective deliberation. Yet when we think about many of our everyday habits, like brushing our teeth or making our beds, right, these things are mere routine. They're activities that are done with little to no thought and almost certainly without any kind of deep reflection. And so many have seen a tension between the kind of thoughtful, reflective person that we would expect a virtuous person to be and the kind of rote, mindless activity that we tend to associate with habit. Right? And so the question is, how can the latter possibly give rise to the former? So my project examines the process of hab Aristotelian habituation by looking at a specific habit, namely the habit of saying please and thank you. So there's a vast literature on Aristotelian character education, but almost all of it is either abstract and theoretical or it's focused very specifically on the kind of formal classroom environment. Attending to a specific habit thus constitutes a relatively unique approach, and I contend it allows us to understand the process of habituation more clearly. Moreover, saying please and thank you seems to be just the right kind of habit to examine. Not only is this habit fairly uncontroversial as part of a virtuous life, right, integral, for example, to the virtues of respect and gratitude, 
it's something that an individual does routinely in a variety of contexts and something that many people habituate their children to do and well before their children are old enough to start formal schooling. So it looks like if any virtuous habit is a candidate for being kind of unreflective and ready-made and thus a problem for the Aristotelian view, it would be this one. So I argue that in thinking about how we tend to go about cultivating this habit, we can see how the process is actually not mindless at all, um, but rather a process that actively fosters critical reflection. So let me um, unpack the process a bit. I'm not claiming that all or even most caregivers actually do these things um, or do them consistently enough for successful habituation. But if you read parenting magazines and blogs and observe the kinds of things that caretakers tend to do in attempting to get their children to say please and thank you, you're likely to see something along these lines. Um, so we begin by ourselves modeling the behavior that we want to see starting before the child can even speak. Right. This can sometimes lead to spontaneous mimicry, but that's unlikely to be consistent. The modeling, however, fosters a burgeoning recognition by the child that you know, saying please and thank you, those are things to be done. And once the child starts speaking, we explicitly correct their requests by, for instance, repeating the request with the word please and then having the child follow suit. Once the expectation that please and thank you are to be employed appropriately is established, we move to offering straightforward prompts along the lines of you know, what do you say when the child forgets a please or a thank you. And over time, these prompts can become more subtle, right? A clearing of the throat, a tap on the shoulder, a raised eyebrow. But notice these kinds of prompts create space for personal reflection and self revision of behavior. By prompting reflection and self-revision, we go a long way toward avoiding mindless repetition by allowing learners to discover for themselves where they've gone wrong and what they've ought to do. So we model the behavior, we correct, we prompt, and then we come to realize that getting a child to habitually say please and thank you is really hard and it often takes a long time for the habit to become established. Fortunately, we have resources in psychology and cognitive science that were unavailable to Aristotle. In particular, the context of skill development in sport, I suggest, provides some useful insights into the process of habituation. So there's one function of habituation about which it seems most everyone agrees. Habituation fosters discernment. The learner comes to recognize that this supplied example or proposed response is a virtuous or vicious one. And eventually they can select their own examples of instances of virtuous or vicious behavior. This notion of fostering discernment is strikingly similar to what researchers in the cognitive science of sport call perceptual cognitive expertise. And it's one of the most significant differences between professional athletes and novices. Central to this expertise is the ability for anticipatory information pickup. In short, expert athletes are better than novices at ignoring irrelevant features of the situation and attending to the relevant features, allowing them to earlier and more accurately predict what's about to transpire, thus giving themselves more time and resources to respond to what's happening. As an example, professional cricket batters actually spend less time with their eye on the ball than novices do. The expert batsmen focus intently on the bowler's release of the ball, but then they perform an anticipatory saccade. That is, they quickly move their eyes to a point ahead of the ball where they expect it to bounce, watching the bounce before moving their eyes quickly ahead again so as to see the ball make contact with the bat. By focusing on the moments that provide them with the most information about how the ball is going to move and ignoring the less informative stretches of ball movement, the expert batsmen give themselves more time and information with which to assess and adjust to the oncoming bowl. So you can see that perceptual cognitive expertise is crucially a matter of discernment. Moreover, examination of perceptual cognitive expertise reveals how the cultivation of discernment involves establishing habits of attention. And this brings to the fore two important points about habituation. First, perceptual cognitive expertise makes clear how training discernment is already imparting views about value, about what's informative, what's irrelevant, what's important, what is not. 
This not only allows us to see how habituation is so much more than mere mechanical conditioning, but also how habituation can be a critically reflective practice. The second is that when we think about the process of habituation into virtue, we need to think about training the underlying habits of attention, not just overt behavior. Consider, for example, how when we raise an expectant eyebrow while awaiting a thank you, right, we're redirecting the learner's attention back toward the person who has facilitated their request. We are training them not to divert their eyes, so their attention so quickly away. We would also do well to think more explicitly about anticipatory information pickup in the context of character education. Um, for instance, priming can be, in a, be, can be effective in bolstering critically reflective habits. For example, one might take a child aside briefly and supportively remind them to you know, find their manners before entering a store or a restaurant, thus readying the child to go into the situation attentive to the relevant social cues. Finally, with character as with sports, one is unlikely to improve without effective feedback. This is why Aristotle insists on the need for teachers in habituation. Right? Otherwise, the repetition of activity may make one worse rather than better. And indeed, the kind of after the fact analysis of situations, kind of analogous to how athletes watch tapes after competition, right? that might be the first kind of explicit teaching that we introduce to learners, um, certainly before ethics lectures. Um, as the learner matures, right, all sorts of teaching can occur in parallel to the ongoing habituation of saying please and thank you, right? Discussions and arguments about empathy and respect, entitlement, gratitude, and so on. Right? Um, so those are a lot of the issues that I'm, I've been exploring um, thanks to the university research summer stipend, and um, I'm hopefully going to continue pursuing over the next year or so. I'm sorry I can't stay for the Q&A because I need to go teach, but I would love to discuss this if anyone wants to reach out via email. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, Dr. Megan is uh, the one coming in and has to go to teach right now. OK, thank you so much for the A4. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Anthony Kosoftas. I hope Very say good. Right. Okay. You did. Thank you. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. My I slides. Put in the slideshow. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Anthony Kutsoftis and I am an associate professor in the Department of Speech Language Pathology here at Seton Hall University. We are housed in the uh, School of Health and Medical Sciences at the IHS campus. I'm going to talk to you today about Project WILD, which is a development and innovation grant project funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. And I promise by the end of this, you'll know what all of these words mean. Um, to start, I want to acknowledge our uh, project staff. Um, uh, the lead on our project, our project coordinator, Stephanie Jaffe, who I think is watching right now, which is great. She's a full-time employee. She runs the project. Um, Michelle and Britt are doctoral research associates that I was able to fund through Project WILD. And we have an undergraduate research assistant as well, all students at the university. I always like to make an acknowledgement to my department chair, even though he's not project staff on this, his support is the only reason why I was able to get this funding. And then on the right side are a list of the collaborators, including Cynthia Peranic, who's the co-PI for the project at Georgia State University. And I do want to thank the American Speech Language Hearing Association because they gave us some money to fly together to meet in, in Georgia at Atlanta to start planning this back in 2018. So that was great. And I want to thank Suli and the committee for the opportunity to share my work today. Um, so what does WILD stand for? It stands for Writing in Children with Language-Based Learning Disabilities. Uh, children with Language-Based Learning Disabilities are those who have difficulties with spoken or written language skills, which have negative impacts on their academic or social outcomes. So these are individuals, these are children who might have been delayed or late talkers or other significantly communication impaired in spoken language. And by the time they get to the fourth or fifth grade, these difficulties are pervasive in all areas of learning. Um, these children are served, oh, uh, in other, 
So there's the children that are born with spoken deficits or later on in school develop written language defi deficits like children with dyslexia or dysgraphia where maybe oral language is not the problem, but when it comes to reading and writing, we see those difficulties. These children are all served through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act through either uh, the umbrella term of communication impairment or specific learning disability. And combined, this is the largest proportion of students served by the IDA program in the United States. Um, and written expression is an identified area need of improvement First, for all children in the country, we are only graduating. 25% of seniors are considered proficient or advanced writers. The rest are considered at basic or below basic levels. And when we look at children with learning disabilities, those numbers are even more uh, stark in their um, ability. So let's get wild. And yes, I do that every time we say let's get wild. Um, to, so to start, I want to talk about the fact that I am a speech language pathologist and why am I working on writing? Because there's a branch of speech language pathology that focuses on language and literacy and the relationship between language functions of the brain and how children use that for learning. And so that is my area of expertise and that's how I was able to get this funding. This is an Institute of Education Sciences grant. IES is the uh, statistics research and evaluation branch of the Department of Education. Another way to think of it is think of IES as the NIH for education with similar funding structure. Um, this development and innovation grant I received is four years and $1.4 million. Yes, they give you money to develop your intervention and test it. And so our whole first year has been developing all of our materials and we got to spend the next three years testing and refining that. Um, the goal of IES is that after we're done developing this, we scale up to initial efficacy and follow up where they give you three to four million dollars to do a nationwide randomized controlled trial. So we'll see. We'll see how this first part goes before we get there. And just in keeping with the theme of the last week, we've been hearing a lot about innovation and collaboration and a lot of what I think about in education is when we add innovation plus collaboration, we end up with creative solutions to some of the biggest problems in education and for Project Wild, that is the ability to write and that's at a basic level. These are the specific aims of the project. I'm going to walk you through pretty quickly. Um, our first aim is to develop an intervention using language based learning strategies that improve writing in fourth and fifth grade children with this language based learning disability. We want to validate the intervention through an iterative process that uses implementation and then usability and fidelity data. And I'll show you a little bit of that in the next slide. Um, of course, we want to look at the effects of the intervention on writing outcomes in students with LLD. And we want to provide initial evidence of implementation in authentic education settings by special educators and speech language pathologists. So in year three, we will conduct an underpowered small randomized control trial where SL speech pathologists and educators in schools are using the intervention to meet aim four. And then aim five is basically about refinements for low responders. Very common in special education interventions are there is always a small group of children three to five kids, a small percentage that don't respond to these very catered interventions. So we built in some time to take a look at why we can't get those kids to move the needle. So we're hoping we can really come out with some specific recommendations about reading and then broader recommendations about learning strategies. Uh, Project Wild is built on an iterative development process, and this is at the heart and center of what we do, where we develop and refine each component of the project. We implement it and measure it with real people, and that could be adults or children, and then we evaluate all of our data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative data. This process happens consistently 
for each year of the project. This table on the right shows by year each of the research activities we're engaging in. We're in year one now where we're developing the intervention, working on content validation and seeking end user feedback. We're partnering with Clifton School District, which is where our IHS campus is. However, if any school district is listening and wants to participate, please contact me. We're always looking for more collaborators. In year two, we're going to make modifications to the intervention as part of this iterative process and we'll do our initial field trial with 12 to 20 students and also a refined field trial for those low and non responders and then we're always refining our professional development because we have the goal of having educators in authentic settings implementing this and so that's a big part is how do we the year we spent writing this intervention how do we get that into a couple hours of a professional development um, in year three, we add further intervention modifications and then we pre prepare for our feasibility study. Don't let the word feasibility fool you. This is a underpowered randomized controlled trial um, where we will be randomizing to 10 interventionists. That's my two minute warning to myself. And in the last year, we spend time with data coding dissemination and we want we have to do a cost analysis and scalability to talk about can schools actually implement this and at what costs and also what benefits. This is an overview of the structure of the intervention. We talk about writing at the word sentence and paragraph levels and in short block one really focuses on word level block two sentence level and block three paragraph level uh, another word for block is unit where we provide eight sessions across four weeks to children and this is provided to them outside of the classroom in the hopes of building and filling the gaps in their writing we have strategies called think say write to get ideas to paper think say outline to plan their ideas and think read revise for revision strategy um, i want to show you some of the artifacts we've created because this is quite honestly the most exciting part um, our lesson plan i don't expect you to read this but just to show you we put together all the materials we're using youtube videos and other materials that are more relatable to children um, because we want to make sure they have background knowledge to write about everything in Project Wild is centered on the environment. And these are just some of the artifacts that we're going to be um, implementing and testing over the next couple of years. So I thank you for the time. This is my uh, contact information and my website. And that 10 minutes went very fast, but thank you for listening. Thank you so very much. 10 minutes went fast. However, mm -hmm. you did provide a very informative uh, information. Thank you so very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Fan Li Jia from Psychology. Uh, you are mute. Uh, yes, here we go. Oh, my son just got into the room. <laughs> then we have to go. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, I don't want him to be a camera, but anyway. Okay. Am I sharing my screen right? Yes. Okay. Good. So uh, thank you for the invitation, and I'm going to presenting my uh, research program. Talk about environmental identity, a uh, behavior engagement from life story perspective. I know we have been sitting here for the whole morning since 10 o'clock. So why not we do some activity together? So it's very short, very brief. If you're there. Uh, it's very simple. I'm going to show you a series of image. If you know the answer, you can just raise your hands up. Right? If you don't know, it's fine. So I always show that to my student, and we get a lot of interesting answers. Okay, I'm going to show you the first row. Right? So if you know the answer, you can raise your hands. Right? And yeah, thank you. So I can see you. if you still know the answer, you can put your hands up. All right can see many people. And what about this things in the second? How many of you know all of them? Just the four items. Mm. Mm, I can see the hands up to one now. I think Suli knows, Dr. Chang knows. Right, so the point, I always show this to the teenagers. So we're probably going to guess already. So a lot of them going to name the brands. They, they can name all the video games. Right, all the celebrities, but not all, all of them can name the trees. And the point here is not counting how many items they know, it, it's, it's the value behind this. Right, think about a young generation. They grow up in this materialistic culture, 
technology, right? Pop cultures, music, movie stars, sport, video games, and they probably gonna value more on that aspect. And how much they value on the nature is unknown, right? So that's gonna lead to my research program. I want to talk about this environmental identity, right? So how they feel about nature, right? like how they identify themselves with the na na nature. So there's like uh, so many research already out there talk about the benefit of identifying with nature. So one recent paper I had is identifying with nature can reduce loneliness and depression. So I work very closely with two collaborators from Canada, Doc Micro Press and Kamal Suva. So some of the works, early works, been uh, uh, including in their work uh, in, in their books, published in 2018, right? And we start this longitudinal uh, data set. So, no, me, but they started this longitudinal data set. Start from age 17. So they they collect the data 15 uh, years ago. So when participants who are age 17, and then follow up with them five times. So I participated in the eight, uh, most recent data collection, age uh, 32. So at participant of age 32, so I gave them a, a environmental questionnaires, talk about their environmental belief environmental identities and environmental involvement. So three scales are what we know in the literature. And in addition to that, I interview and we in, in interview all participants at age 32. I think there's about 112. Just, just ask them to talk about a story, right? It's so like they can have many, many stories to tell and why that particular story stands out, right? And then particularly on that environment. So we ask them a few of them, just environmental scenes, like the most important story, environmental moral courage. So they see something, someone harm the environment, they have the moral courage to stop them. A moral coward means they saw something or someone harm the environment, but they don't do anything. So they feel cowardness. Turning point, how their environmental view turned to be positive. And we do have some participants talk about negative view. And teaching story, how they teach next generation and how they view about future environment. So the advantage of doing so is we quantify those qualitative interviews. So we look at meaning making, how story uh, relate to their self and how detailed the story is and how impact to the person. So we compose a score we call environmental narrative identity to look at how their story like, like uh, described. So we did find the correlations people who are environmentalist activists, right? Or uh, who have environmental view or identify nature more, they tend to tell a better story. Like the story is meaningful to them, very detailed and very Im impactful. And another advantage by doing so, since we have longitudinal data, so we can look at individual growth on a variety of variables. So that's the only one variable I highlight here. They call a generative concern, it means like thinking about future, thinking about a future generation, care about future generation. So we run a latent growth model, it means like we can look at the initial starting point. So I use like when they are age 22, 23, and then how they grow after the nine years when they are uh, age 32. So we can look at the starting point and the growth rate. So both of them predict uh, their environmental narrative identity. And another one, the advantage we doing this, we can look exactly the motivation behind that. Right? So for quantitative ways, we know the correlation, we know the trends, but we don't know the motivation behind. So we look at the interview in specific and we come up a few narrative themes by using a qualitative approach. Right? So a lot of people talk about their early life, view that they feel very powerless, right? So they feel more, they want, they want to have more empowered about to help the environment. And a lot of people talk about uh, having a, a child or children as a focus for a crystallized environmentalism. So they want to have leave something for, for their kid, resources, and one key factor is the environment. And most importantly, I want to highlight this. A lot of people, uh, emerging adults, they're age 32, but young adults, talk about their early memory on their specific family tradition. So they talk about what they have done with their kid, uh, with their parents, with their grandparents on a variety of environmental events. So that third, second, third point lead to a research study I'm conducting. So I wanna know exactly what parents do with their kid for a environmental nature event, right? And we started 
uh, environmental interview in China. So the reason why it's in China, because I have a, a visiting scholar last year from China. So we had this project uh, going on for, for, for two years. And we just interview uh, 45 parents, just talk about uh, just free, just write down, you know, from an from, uh, individual and group perspective, like what have you done with your children to uh, engage with the na nature for the past few years? And we got a lot of an answers, right? We got like about 475 uh, different answers. So we combine them together, right, to, uh, to come up with a scale to uh, test their uh, parent-child engagement uh, activity with the environment. Right? So some, some of them talk about uh, separating garbage. Some of them talk about uh, just going out in nature to identify plants, animal, insects. Some of them talk about just go to the, uh, uh, the park. And we also give them the environmental literacy scale. They are standardized to uh, talk about environmental knowledge. Like so one simple item, it's like most of oxygen in atmosphere come from animal, water, sand, earth, and plants. So the answer should be plants. And can be a little bit tough one. Animals today are most likely to become extinct because, right, we have 34 people give A, 310 people give B, 92 people give C, and the correct answer is D, right, the habitat where they live is destroyed. So most people got right, but still there's variability. And in addition, we give them environmental behavior scales, right, so we have them uh, different factors, talk about uh, participatory collecting, reuse, waste reduced disposal, going outdoor normative behavior, and or uh, at home energy conservation. So we are working on uh, different papers on conceptualize how those variables related. And also we wanna validate this parent-child engagement. And we also give a children's environmental essay to write. So each of the child wrote like about 100 words, how they view about environment. And also we wanna look at outcomes of being a young environmental leaders in the future. Okay, so the, here's my lab. And in our department, we have an environmental club. So any student or faculty interested in health environment, please let me know. And here's some other works I don't have time to uh, to present within 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Jia. Um, you may organize one next year to talk more. Then. Thank you. Um, Next speaker is uh, Dr. Anka Gruko. Anka Gruko, thank you. Correctly? Yes, let me try to share my thank you. PowerPoint. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so my name is Anka Greco. I'm an economist in Stillman School of Business. And I would like to start by first uh, thanking all the organizers for really the hard work of uh, getting us together uh, to, to present some of our work. Now, this paper is already published, but I thought it would be interesting considering that is a paper on telehealth. And it used to be the case that I always had to explain what this is, uh, but not anymore. Now I can move on and everybody knows what telehealth is all about. But before COVID, before COVID, before all of us started using um, medical services through um, other methods of communication, through electronic methods of communication, uh, telemedicine was introduced for a different purpose. And that was the difficult access to medical care. Even in the United States, there are a lot of people living in rural countries, counties that have no access to easy access to medical care. There are no hospitals and some counties uh, don't even have uh, physicians. So the solution was introduced to be access medical advice through electronic devices. Uh, it's called telemedicine and telecare and it has many variations. However, uh, the important part that we're going to focus on is the concerns that raised in some people's minds. The take up rate has been relatively slow and not necessarily driven by technology, but rather by concerns as to how these types of services will be used. Uh, because the users are not only people with poor access to traditional care, in-person care, uh, those in rural location or with mobility constraints, but there are also people that use these services for convenience, uh, people with high value of time, people that want to economize on time. I uh, took my child to, uh, to the doctor in person and I had to wait 75 minutes 
I took the, my child to the same doctor for a, a telecare visit and I waited 20 seconds. So there's a very big difference. And this is going to be more and more important, not only because of COVID, as you can see, uh, the prevalence of telemedicine visits has increased tremendously from about 1.1% pre-COVID to 35.3% in the second quarter of uh, 2020. So that's a huge increase. The data that I use, however, is pre-COVID, and there are uh, some conclusions that we can use to infer what is going to happen as these types of services are used more and more in the, in the future. So let me give you a brief introduction as to what might be uh, the telecare issues that people are concerned about. First, lower quality. Can the physician uh, collect as much information through a telemedicine visit as they could with an in-person visit? And the answer is no. Uh, the quality of telecare visits is of similar, but not identical. In fact, slightly lower than in-person visits. The second concern is, are these substitutes or are they complements to traditional care? Uh, why is this a concern? Is because it goes to the increase in cost of healthcare, which has been uh, really quite rapid in the recent uh, period. If it substitutes traditional care, then the concern is that it may be of lower quality, but it actually saves on the cost. If it's a complement to tr traditional care, uh, then the question is, okay, now people are using not only in-person visits, but in addition to that, some telecare visits, which is going to lead to an increase in cost of care. The one thing that needs to be pointed out is that if telecare leads to earlier care and wards off deterioration of health, then there may be savings. So let's see, this is exactly uh, the scope of this paper. We're looking at one limitation in the use of telecare, and that is insurance coverage. When insurance, private insurance covers these types of services, then people are more likely to use them. And some states passed regulation that requires private health insurance plans to cover telehealth provided services to the same extent and in a similar manner as traditional in-person services. I suspect those were the, also the states that had an easier time transitioning to this type of care during COVID. So what's the impact? There might be an increase in use of medical care because of easier access, uh, but there might be a decrease in use of medical care if early access prevents deterioration of health. So there might be a shift in terms of what types of services are used most. This is the data that I'm using, and it shows uh, the shaded areas are states that adopted these types of regulation, where access to telecare is thus much easier uh, because they are covered by insurance. And we're using data from several data sets to ensure reliability. We expect um, to be we, what we would like to see is consistency across uh, sources of data, because then we can rely on these types of results. What do we find? What we find is when access to these types of services is easier, we see an increase in primary care. In other words, the people in these states experience a decrease in the probability they would delay routine checkup. And you can tell as we're looking across outcomes, whether they're del delaying why checkups by one year, two years or five years, the results are always consistent. So what we conclude is that people that had difficulty accessing, as accessing medical care are now more likely to ask for this type of checkups. However, we found no significant changes in overall health outcomes, and these uh, results seem to hold on two different data sets. So on the on the bright side, we don't see a deterioration of health outcomes, as some may have pointed out might happen if telecare visits may be of lower quality. But we don't also don't see an improvement in health outcomes. The caveat to these results is that with our data, we cannot follow individuals for a very long period afterwards. So these are the way you should interpret this. There are no significant changes in overall health outcomes in short run. We cut the data even more to look at areas in which people are more likely to use these types of services. So we, we look in rural uh, versus metropolitan area versus urban non-metropolitan. And that's where we do see more movement. We see a reduction in secondary care, emergency visits and surgeries, and improvements in health outcomes in non-metropolitan areas. 
Now, these are not rural areas. However, the data that we're using is hospital data. And we don't really have that many hospitals in rural areas. So we expect people from rural areas that need these types of services to go to the closest hospital, which may be urban non-metropolitan. So these are the results. The picture shows that we see the solid lines shows people in states that have these types of regulations that enable the use of telecare. And the dotted lines are people in states that don't have these types of regulation. So you see that nothing changes in states that don't pass this type of regulation. However, when telecare becomes easier, when private insurance cover these types of services, we see a drop in outpatient visits in hospitals. We see a drop in emergency visits. We see a drop in surgeries. And that is um, actually a good sign because it shows that Improving access to telecare can curb increase in hospital utilization rates. This is something that is also very expensive. So in all likelihood, uh, easier access to telehealth is cost effective. It's likely to reduce cost in the future. With one caveat, it is possible, it is possible, and that's something not uh, we could not do in this paper, that when telehealth is a substitute instead of a complement to traditional services, there may be a worsening of outcomes in long term. Again, it's all a question of technology and how this technology is used in the future. And uh, this is what I had. I actually do have another slide that says thank you, but it does not work at this point, so I'm going to stop here. OK, well, thank you so very much. It's very uh, refreshing uh, information. So our next speaker is Dr. Lisa De Luca. Um, from uh, library, University Library. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, Sorry. I think so. Yeah, OK. Let me just put it in presentation mode. OK, yeah. great. Wonderful. OK, uh, thank you so much, Suli, and thank you to the committee uh, being part of this uh, panel taught me how much work goes into Petersheim and thank you to the whole committee. It's it's really amazing. Um, so my presentation is about the Freedom of Information Act. And how there's a lot of information uh, accessible to citizens, researchers, nonprofits that is not easily findable on the web. So it's, and also uh, journalists, watchdog groups. So um, I wrote an article a couple years back um, and identified that there's over 240 FOIA libraries. And basically, I just want to get across that these are amazing uh, repositories of information that are available, um, especially with COVID now, um, you know, the CDC, you will have access to um, frequently requested documents um, from these agencies. They're required under the FOIA to post this information. And, you know, if, if you or a student in your class is making a Freedom of Information um, Act request, it's important to know what portals are out there uh, because maybe somebody has asked your question already, or maybe it's a similar enough question um, and a response is posted. Um, we know there could be redactions um, and you might not see the whole document, but it's important to know where to go to save yourself time. Um, you know, and I tell, I tell your students when we work with them that my job as a librarian is a coach to help you save time and work efficiently. Um, so some of the key findings were that um, just simply using the term FOIA library with your um, search terms can get you right to these information portals. Um, and the posted FOIA responses in these portals may not be findable on Google or any web search because of the redactions. So each government agency uses different technology. 
um, different page viewers. So when they post the content online, um, this information may not be discoverable through a Google search. Um, they have put in um, tags to help you locate these documents. Um, and I just think it's really important for high school students, your students at Seton Hall um, to have exposure to um, using some of these research portals. Maybe some of our School of Diplomacy colleagues want their students to find declassified documents. Um, and then naming conventions. Um, there's a variety because, of course, again, these almost 300 government agencies, um, there isn't a lot of standardization. Um, the uh, rules are set out by the Department of Justice and the National Archives. They each have agencies that oversee the FOIA, but you can see here from my findings that there's a huge variety in um, what these repositories are called. Um, it runs the gamut. And then this slide quickly uh, shows you that a simple FOIA search, um, so if you search FOIA, library, and immigration, it immediately takes you to um, the different agencies that are dealing with um, immigration issues. Again, is everything that you want posted? No. Are these um, documents, uh, do they have a lot of uh, redactions? Yes, but you can at least see um, what's there and I still think this is really valuable um, for the students. Um, and um, the other thing, the other point is that a student may have to search multiple agencies um, to find the information that they're looking for. OK, and then also in terms of historical content across a lot of disciplines, you can use these repositories um, again for research assignments. You see that this is from the um, CIA reading room and there's value in discovering just how many items have been posted per year. Um, you can find information about the Bay of Pigs, human rights in Latin America. There's so much content that that could be pulled into the classroom. And this slide uh, just quickly shows you what is required. Um, this is under the FOIA Amendment Act of uh, from 1996. So opinions, you, you can read what's here, frequently requested records. That's what um, researchers and students are going to find. Um, also, presidential libraries are an amazing resource for you. And again, each uh, presidential library is run independently of one another. So naming conventions just to get to these repositories is different for each one. Um, but again, you're, you may find different FOIA content in the Reagan Library, for example, um, that you would find on the Department of States uh, in their FOIA library. And then to make things even more confusing, um, there's different portals within the government that bring agency information together. You know, eventually this will all dovetail together, um, but this is FOIAonline.gov and you see there's maybe 20 agencies here um, that have their content posted. There's another portal for uh, dealing with national intelligence where different agencies are posted. So it really just takes some finesse and um, you know, I'm looking forward to researching this further um, to talk about how there can be more outreach um, for this type of content available. Um, it's difficult to get information from the government. I'm, the FOIA Advisory Committee does meet quarterly and their meetings are live streamed. Um, but initiatives that they have to collect feedback um, are often only available to government employees. Um, so that doesn't really help us out very much. Um, but that is it and I want to thank you for your time. Here's a link to um, 
more research resources about this topic if anybody wanted to um, bring FOIA libraries into their classroom, please reach out to me. Um, and also a plug for our new data services team that can help your students um, with Stata, SPSS, Atlas TI. We've gotten, we've uh, purchased a lot of new software um, that's available. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate that, that you have acknowledged the academic expeditions the planning committee make this uh, um, presentation possible. Yes, we did work a lot and then we appreciate your appreciation. Oh my gosh, okay. yes. <laughs> so um, thank you to all our wonderful speaker. Um, in my whole career by now, uh, I have been asked to give a research presentation at a different time lens from five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and 60 minutes. And the most difficult, most challenging talk when I was asked, it's always uh, five to 10 minutes. And I always would think about, do I want to do it? Do I want to do it? But I always say yes. And that kind of, I know how challenging it, and then I always want to improve how I talk. And then I have to mention that you 12 speakers are so wonderful and controlling the time, um, give the very insightful information, um, sharing, and then uh, I know we are not, I'm not in your field, but I believe I catch most of the information. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. And I would like to ask uh, Lisa, can you can stop sharing your screen now? And then I also like to everybody turn on your uh, camera because I like to take a pre-gathering shot. So I would have everybody on my record. Turn on your camera, please, so I can see your face. Thank you so much, everybody attending this. Turn on your camera. Great. Hi, Joy. <laughs> um, OK, already. So smile. Thank you. You will see this uh, uh, photo shot. OK, so um, as I mentioned earlier, I asked uh, my co-chair, Dr. Jose Lopez, uh, agree, allow me to have this uh, poster symposium luncheon chatting um, for anybody have questions to each other and also like to um, share with you my thought and then see if your input what do we do next for the faculty um, um, university faculty research symposium? Just let you know that uh, the very last one have this kind of faculty um, research presentation, not not so big as the twelve of you, uh, was a two thousand two. Count it back, eighteen nineteen years ago, when today we are celebrating twenty fifth uh, anniversary of Expo faculty research or faculty um, never really come to Expo. Something we I like to everybody think about that. What do we do? And then uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Mike Lofante, contact you all, put all your name to uh, Expo. And then thanks to my whole committee, uh, allow me to be the moderator to put this uh, um, into this, into this, although it's not original, you will say you will speak for 30 minutes, but you are so great to put all your information in the 10 minutes. I really appreciate it. OK, so uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Jose so you can uh, share a little bit and then ask everybody uh, to give your information, uh, your thought. Um, thank you, Suli. Um, wonderful session, and it's great to see many of our colleagues. Uh, I think as was mentioned <laughs> earlier, um, we we don't get to see each other too often, uh, even when we're not in this time of of a coronavirus. Um, and and it's it's great to see everybody and and uh, and learn just a snippet. As we said, uh, we we um we were looking to do larger sessions, but but um but but this this tended to work out. But but as as, as Suli just mentioned, one of the things we we would want to do is we've done a great job over the last. Uh, 25 years of integrating our students into the expo, but the expo is also about uh, the faculty. It's also about all the scholars that we have here on campus. 
and uh, we want to showcase those. I think uh, events like this one will allow our students, uh, many students across the university, to see what happens in, in the School of Diplomacy, in the School of Business, uh, what happens all over campus. And I think that'll create the more of this culture we're looking to create that the Expo looks to, to advance and promote, which is this culture of, of a learning community, but also a, a research and scholarly community that's contributing to um, the university, but also the, the local and, and you know world in general, the global society that we are. So thank you once again for, for this wonderful, wonderful uh, session we, 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 hope we had today. Thank you. Uh, Suli, for all you did, I mean, uh, as you saw, Suli is the one of the most patient human beings on the planet, and she <laughs> went through all this. So, thank you, and um, and I, I guess I throw it back to you, Suli. You, you should end the session. Hey, Jose is my best partner, uh, and I, if you attend the opening, uh, he actually is the best uh, MC in my view. Thank you, Jose.